Hi everyone, welcome to this video all about the unseen extract task for paper two, section A of the political and social protest writing A-level paper. Um, the extract that I'm using is an extract that I've created, so it's not been seen before as far as I know. Um, and it is called You Will Be Safe Here, which is a novel that I read last year in the summer holiday. Um, the aim of this video is to familiarise you with the question, because the question is always the same. Um, it's then to engage critically with the synopsis that the examiner gives you at the top of the extract, to then read and analyse the extract itself, and then end with an example essay in terms of showing you how you could bring it all together. You have approximately an hour on this task. It's a three hour exam and there's three questions in it, so an hour each. And of that hour, I would suggest to students spending about 15 minutes annotating and reading critically the extract in order to put yourself in the best possible place for you committing to writing the answer. So take a good chunk of time to familiarise yourself with the extract because of the very nature of the fact that it's unseen. You need a little bit more time. So the question is in the box here. It's always the same. And what this question is asking you to do is to um, connect the genre of political and social protest writing with the extract. So the elements of political and social protests like rebellion, secrecy, injustice, democracy, dystopia, all this kind of stuff, is what is really important with this question. Um, so that is what is uh, being assessed here, AO4 really, the connecting assessment objective. At the top of the at the top of the extract, you will get a synopsis, and this is the case for it being prose, poetry or drama. Um, and I have always said to students that they need to be reading this extract and spending three minutes or so reading and highlighting the key and significant bits of information that the exam board gives you. The exam board has written this, they're helping you, it would be foolish to ignore it. So it, it often helps contextualise the extract and put students on the right track. So before you even read the extract, I would encourage students to have a highlighter and read this and to critically engage with this information. So this is what it says. And then I will ask you to pause the video if you want. And then I'll go through um, what is significant about this synopsis. You Will Be Safe Here is a novel by Damien Barr, published in 2019. The extract is from the beginning of the novel, which centres around the events of the Second Boer War in 1901. Boer translates as farmer. The scorched earth policy enabled British troops to torch the farms of South African natives who refused to surrender to British rule. In total, 30,000 farms were torched, creating 116,000 homeless people, mostly women and children. They were then transported to camps created and controlled by the British. Here, 17,000 died. In this extract, Mrs van der Watt is describing what happened when British personnel came to her farm and destroyed it. She is writing her diary in secret in the hope that her missing husband will read it. Hands uppers became a colloquial term for people who put their hands up in surrender and signed the oath of allegiance to the British Empire. So pause this video, write down what you regard to be significant, and then I'll go through uh, some of the key bits. OK, so as is always the case with the synopsis, there are in, there's information in here which is relevant to uh, the extract in terms of what you then say in your essay. That's why it's there for. So the first is the date. Very contemporary piece of 21st century literature. So it's looking back at historical events. It's, it's, it's revising or looking back at historical event, events. The main... Uh, I suppose, historical uh, factor or event in this extract is the Second Boer War at the turn of the century, which translates as farmer. And that is significant because with war, of course, you're going to get injustice, power, rebellion, violence, etc. So with war comes a whole bunch of these political and social protest elements. What's also significant is that farmer suggests land. And then you have the scorched earth policy, which again suggests land. So farming, the countryside, the pastoral, land being a commodity which is taken away as a punishment by people that don't do as the British say. So the scorched earth policy, a particular policy here, 
which we see in this extract would also be significant to mention perhaps in your essay. Surrendering to British rule means the British are perhaps uh, more powerful or want to be more powerful during a time of empire, when Britain uh, was obviously conquering many foreign lands around the world. Um, the protagonist, the narrator, is Mrs. Van der Watt, and she is writing a diary in secret, which suggests that she has the capacity to rebel. She has courage and bravery because she is accepting of any consequence that she might endure if she was found to be writing something that she shouldn't have been writing. But a diary, of course, paper can easily be destroyed. So and it can also be censored. Um, so that's also significant as well. We in this extract get told what happens when a number of British personnel come to Mrs. Wonderwatt's farm and destroy it. So the fact that it's destroyed uh, again goes to show the injustice here. They're not doing as she is told. She's not doing as she's told, and there's a consequence to it. And that consequence is she's in effect she loses everything, and she's made homeless because she refuses to sign the oath of uh, neutrality to Britain. Her husband is also missing, which is also quite mysterious and creates paranoia because the more unanswered, uh, unanswered questions we have, the more paranoia there may be. And paranoia also increases in a dystopian situation like this. So there are a number of significant things in this synopsis. What's also interesting, if you look at the epilogue of this novel, um, if you turn to the back, Damien Barr wrote a little paragraph where he said that these camps, that the British created to house these women and children in is actually where Hitler got the idea for the Holocaust from, uh, the idea of concentration camps from, which I thought was quite chilling, seeing as uh, Britain might have been responsible for giving him that idea. The reason why they died here was not because of um, because of being gassed like they were in the Holocaust. Uh, they died because of poor conditions. So they were not killed, at least directly by the British, but they suffered quite bad conditions in those camps. So we're not talking here about um, gas chambers like with the Holocaust. But anyway, some important facts, uh, factors to bear in mind when we start to read the extract. So always engage with that synopsis. That's why it's there to help you. Before I show you the extract, I want to show you a couple of images. The picture on the left, of course, is a photograph of a torched farm with the owners looking at it aghast, as you can expect. And you know, they've lost everything uh, as a result. They've lost their livelihoods um, and therefore they are now homeless. The picture on the right hand side is clearly an artist's impression um, and it shows a group of women and children uh, very upset, as you can see, uh, turning their back on their home, which has been set alight by the British because these women perhaps refused to sign uh, to the uh, oath of neutrality to the British. So they, they lost everything. So this is essentially what we're talking about in this extract here. I will give you a slight warning. The extract does finish quite graphically uh, regarding the treatment of animals. So I'm just going to make you aware of that now. Uh, but of course, with this module, from time to time, we're going to be reading quite serious things which are unpleasant. So we just have to be prepared for something like that. If you're going to be commenting on cruelty, you're going to have to read about something that's cruel. Um, so this is why I like this module. It is powerful. And, um, you know, it, it is um, interesting as well. Sometimes serious events uh, provide interesting analysis. So let me read through the extract then. Uh, and like I said, this is an extract that I have created myself. Uh, so it isn't available anywhere else. So this is really good practice for this task because, um, of course, this is unseen to you in the same way that it's unseen to you in the exam. So uh, it's, it's good practice. So Mrs. Wondervot says, they met me in the kitchen, six of them, looking around as if a band of commandos might jump out of the cupboard. I wish they would. Corporal Johnson spoke. Before we get started, perhaps you'd like to use the, um, he gestured vaguely behind me. I know we've arrived rather early. His eyes wandered down to my body, stopping at my waist. I suppose this was kindness, but I refused to leave them alone in my kitchen. In that case, please sit, Mrs. Van der Watt. This is Brigadier Durham, he said as if introducing us after church. So I sat at my own table. Brigadier Durham took off his helmet, which sported a dusty ostrich feather, and placed it in the crook of his left arm. The others promptly followed. His grey moustache twitched into a taut smile. From a scarlet leather folder embossed with gold, 
the corporal passed the brigadier a crisp sheet of paper, which she slid over to me. It was neatly typed in our language and theirs. This is the oath of neutrality, he explained at a schoolroom pace. This oath says you will cease to offer support to the Republican rebels, that you will surrender any and all possessions which can offer material aid to said rebels, and it proclaims you as a subject of Her Majesty Victoria, by the grace of God, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland Queen, Defender of the Earth, Empress of India. I pushed it away. The corporal lifted the lid of last night's mutton still warm on the stove and took a deep sniff. As I said, sir, he chimed, these Boer women out here for far too long, quite uncivilised. The brigadier stood and put his helmet back on and his men followed as one. He sighed. Mrs van der Watt, nothing you say or do can stop what is about to happen, but if you sign the oath, I promise you it will go easier on you after. I had not thought there would be an after. We are not here to harm you, the brigadier insisted. He leaned over me, so close his moustache almost brushed my cheeks, his breath rich with an officer's diet. We are here to stop this war, to bring peace. And to do that, we need you to stop giving support to your men out there on commando, the ones cutting our train lines and shooting at us from farms, where the white flag flies. These same rebels are even burning the homes of your fellow countrymen who see the sense of what we're doing. Hands up, us, they're not my countrymen, they're cowards. They are sensible, Mrs. Van der Watt. Resistance only prolongs matters, stops us protecting Her Majesty's loyal subjects here and securing what is rightly ours. We are simply here to make sure all men receive equal rights under British law. Sign the oath and we'll take very good care of you and your children. I refused. Madam, said the brigadier, picking up the paper and handing it back to the corporal, who placed it carefully in his folder. There's no need for a scene. Corporal Johnson, have your men begin. The chickens were keckling for Fred to fetch their eggs. The corporal strode towards their coop, and I shouted stop, but his hand was already on the bolt. Out they streaked between his boots, like little white comets. Comets. Methodically, they rounded the birds up, cornering them against the wire. This is a farm. Fred knows what happens, but I told him not to look. Still, he saw the first one done. Squadrons of wasps, drawing by the blood, drawn by the blood, buzzed over the small white cairn of heads. We are about to begin indoors. You may have five minutes to remove anything you can carry. I grabbed my Bible, Fred's christening cup, my needlework case, this diary and pencils. Everything else they carried out and neatly stacked on a wagon. Ten years of our life gone in a single morning while I sat and watched. The bowl and mirror from our bedroom, the bedstead you card for our first anniversary, our little wicker chair, Fred's bed, our table and chairs, my pots and pans, the armchair, pictures of our parents, Fred's christening robe and my wedding gown. I'm surprised they didn't take the very air. Last chance, Mrs. Van der Watt. Sign. No, shouted Fred in English. No, no, no. The brigadier nodded at the corporal, we took out a box of matches, struck one and tossed it on our roof. The corporal struck another match and held it to the thatch, whispered dry midsummer. It took three more matches to smoke properly. The remaining animals, said the brigadier. I didn't know whether to cover Fred's eyes or ears. Let him watch, Mrs. Van der Watt, said the corporal. Let him see what happens when you don't do as you are told. And so I watched Fred watch as our cows and pigs were slit nose to tail, mulberries still in their stomachs, screams still in their throats. The big man with Bush's arms worked fast, hacking and sawing and swatting away the flies. Soon our animals were no more than cuts of meat arranged with surprising delicacy on wooden crates. They shoveled the innards down the well and kicked salt over our vegetable garden, scuffing it with their boots. Nothing will grow there. The skin on my face drew tight as the flames danced across our roof. Okay, so that's the extract. Uh, I told you it ended quite graphically, didn't I? Um, so um, that is what happens, and that's the extract. So what we're going to do now is you can pause the video and go back, of course, and um, look at any key phrases that you think you'd want to talk about. I appreciate it's difficult because it's a video and you don't have the paper version, um, but you might want to just write down some ideas. And then what I will do is I will continue and annotate the extract with you in terms of what should jump out at you as significant in terms of connecting this extract to political and social protest. So let's go back to the beginning. 
Noticing yellow, always look out for character names because sometimes those character names can be to do with rank and file and power. So corporal and brigadier suggests status. Much more status perhaps than Mrs van der Watt has, at least in terms of the military or the army. There are six men, so she's outnumbered, unnecessary force and threat. And there's also something quite overbearing and predatory about these men, the way in which they look at her. Um, they look down. I think they ask her, do you want to go and use the toilet, perhaps? Um, but the way in which their eyes wander over her body suggests something that's quite um, intrusive. And that obviously represents how they've uh, let themselves into this farm. They're trespassing, aren't they? They have no permission to be there. So in her own home, she's actually alienated. So she's been told to sit at her own kitchen table where this is her kitchen. This is her table. And yet she made, she's made to feel like a stranger. So she's very alienated by the presence of these men. What I also found interesting was the possessions that the, uh, the, um, the men have. They have lovely kind of leather folders embossed with gold. They have a crisp sheet of paper, neatly typed, a scarlet leather folder. So the possessions they have is at odds with the modest possessions of the farmhouse. Um, the farmhouse and Mrs. Van der Vaart doesn't really have anything expensive. Um, and yet these men are coming in clearly with, with, with riches. So that suggests a, a power imbalance and a symmetry in power. They are elitist. There's a hierarchy here. When the men start to teach uh, Mrs. Van der Vaart about the oath they want her to sign, they are described as talking at schoolroom pace, meaning they're quite patronising because they see her as other. Um, there might be a language barrier, but it is coming across as very patronising here. Um, and they kind of see her as something different um, straight away. It's interesting in terms of monarchy. Again, you might get an unseen extract about monarchy. Obviously, monarchy and empire in this case is synonymous with power. Um, and we are all invited to be subjects of the monarchy, such as the king or queen. Um, so she is basically agreeing by signing this oath to be inferior and she doesn't want to be. So she's signing her allegiance to a foreign power and in doing she's re rejecting her own country, which is why she is refusing. And it's interesting that Queen Victoria's full title is given here, including the grace of God, um, again suggesting there's a theocratic element here, a religious legitimacy here perhaps in terms of what they're doing. The men feel that they have the right to do this to this farm because Queen Victoria, they're doing it for the monarch and, and therefore it's worth doing. Moving on, the fact that she pushes that piece of paper away, white I think, in this extract, suggests that she is rebelling and she has courage because she's, she's prepared to uh, accept the consequence of her actions rather than just simply signing the oath. So she has a uh, strength of character here. The corporal looks on the stove and he sees last night's meal, which was mutton, which suggests a family that has a modest living uh, because mutton is a relatively cheap form of food. Um, they're seeing the family as uncivilised, which is obviously hugely ironic and hypocritical because I would argue isn't destroying somebody's home uncivilised. So it's an interesting use of that adjective uncivilised there. The men followed as one, suggesting that they are following the leader. And that's something else you sometimes see with characters in this kind of text. Um, there's often a leader and there's often those that follow. The predatory presence of the men continues, so much so that she felt his moustache almost brush against her cheek. Um, and the smell of his breath suggests that he's eating much better food, more expensive food than Mrs. Van der Vaart and her son, Fred. So clearly there's a difference there in terms of the food they're eating. Interestingly, at the bottom, again, a huge piece of irony. Uh, the man says, um, the brigadier says, that um, the people that are um, burning homes are very uncivilised uh, and the rebels are burning homes as if it's awful. But of course, that's exactly what they end up doing. So it's interesting that they're warping what's awful or not, based on their own agenda. So I found that also deeply ironic. Um, Mrs. Watt uh, continues to refuse. So again, that, that rebellion is continuing. 
Um, and the manipulation here. So manipulation is another form of, of element of political and social protest. The things that they are saying, they're trying to persuade her to sign this oath, even though what they might be saying is untrue. Um, you know, is it rightly theirs? Is this, this farm rightly theirs? The answer, of course, is no. They have no business being on this farm. It's not their property. It's not even their country. So what are they there for? So again, it's ironic. They, they, it's not theirs at all. How can they have the audacity to uh, suggest what they're doing is for equal rights when they're effectively making people homeless and destroying their livelihoods? So again, there's a hugely ironic, hypocritical and manipulative tone in what they're saying here. And then what happens is the cruelty. So cruelty is another aspect of um, this module. The cruelty towards the house and the animals. So this is a farm. Yes, you make a living from slaughtering your own animals uh, and maybe selling them, but it's another thing to kill them just because you are not happy with a woman not doing as she's told. So I thought that the chickens here being trapped in their pen is a bit metaphorical. It represents how trapped Mrs. Wonder Watt is perhaps in her own home um, as these men are trying to get her to sign this, um, this oath. It's violent, it's a punishment, it's cruel, not just to the to um, the chickens, of course, but to the owners of those chickens, um, because those chickens produce eggs, probably. And without chickens, you don't get eggs. So they're destroying what they own um, almost as a tantrum, really, but also as a consequence. And there's, a, there's an idea that her chickens and these animals and her farm has been sacrificed because she won't give in to their request of signing this this oath. Um, then what happens is um, the men give Mrs. Wondervat five minutes to get her things. And what she grabs is very modest things, a Bible, a christening cup, a needlework case and the diary that we're now reading. So she's not grabbing anything expensive. She's not grabbing jewellery. She's not grabbing photographs, for example. She's grabbing very simple things that she can carry. Um, Notice as well, though, an added layer of cruelty by these men. They're taking with them things that they have absolutely no interest in whatsoever because they're sentimental things. A stranger has absolutely no interest in your wedding photos. They have absolutely no interest in pictures of your parents because they don't share the same parents. So they're taking these things out of pure cruelty um, and they're sentimental and they're never going to be seen again. So they are, in, in fact, having this added layer of cruelty. They are removing things that have sentimental value that cannot be replaced. Fred is the son of um, Mrs. Van der Vaart, as you might have guessed, and he also starts to rebel by shouting no four times. Uh, he also shouts no in, the, in English, which would not have been his native language. So again, showing the child is also prepared to rebel despite having a younger age. And then they take a match or several and begin to burn the home with the thatch roof. And because it's so dry, it burns relatively easily. And then in this last paragraph, we have that graphic and quite disturbing cruelty towards the animals. Yes, it's a farm, but you don't kill animals like this uh, for this purpose. So the verbs hacking and sawing and swatting is very inhumane and animalistic. The animals are being sacrificed um, because of um, Mrs. Van der Vaart's rebellion, really. And as a mother, what she's trying to do is she's trying to protect Fred from seeing and hearing this. Um, and she's probably relatively unsuccessful at doing so. So this is also showing not only the loss of, of um, livelihood, but also the loss of innocence and the corruption of innocence here, because children aren't supposed to be seeing this. Not only that, they don't only really kill all the animals. Um, but they also ruin the ground by putting salt in it. And if you put salt in the ground, you won't be able to grow anything because it ruins the soil. So again, they can't have animals, but they also cannot now grow their own vegetables either. So the farm is pretty useless. What is a farm without land and arable and livestock? Not, not really very much at all. So these men are being very cruel and they have basically completely destroyed any livelihood that the family had. Um, so lots of things to talk about in this extract, which I think makes it a very interesting and a very good extract to use for practice of the unseen question, even if 
um, it is relatively graphic and disturbing in places. So before we turn to the, um, the essay structure, I'm going to remind you of some of the terms, some of the aspects of or elements of political and social protest that we've seen. All of these, we have the large world of the Boer War and the scorched earth policy versus the small world of the family and this particular farm. Uh, obviously, the hypocrisy of, of the men. Um, the persecution of these of Mrs. Wonderwatt and her her children or, or Fred, and that creates a very authoritarian and dystopian existence, which war often does. In war, there's always going to be somebody on the bottom of the social ladder and or, or, always going to be somebody that's persecuted. And in this case, it is the South Africans. Narrative perspective, we obviously are seeing the events from Mrs. Van der Watt's perspective, which is important because, of course, it gives credibility to what happened. She was there. She's seeing this with her own eyes and writing it down in her diary in secret. So that adds weight to what she is saying because she's clearly not making it up. So I'd be encouraging students to use, you know, a lot of those terms, maybe not all of them, but certainly, uh, you know, a fair few of them in their response to show that they are connecting the extract to the genre of political and social protest. So the last thing I want to turn to now is the essay, because it's all very well, you know, spending half hour or so talking about the extracts and what's going on. But at the end of the day, this is an essay based course, as you know, you need to be able to put some ideas down in an essay format on paper. So what is that going to look like? So I would perhaps be thinking of using an essay plan like this. We're talking here four paragraphs, overview, settings, the men, and then Mrs. Van der Watt. That would be my paragraph plan. And that is the plan that I'm going to be following for the rest of this video in terms of showing you an example response uh, in terms of how you could use this um, extract to write the answer. So this is the um, introduction, also doubles up as the overview of the extract. The extract comes from a contemporary novel which presents the injustices and cruelty of war, in this case the Boer War in South Africa at the turn of the 20th century. The extract reinforces how war can often come with unfairness and violence targeted at innocent people. As a result, the political backdrop of the Boer War in the macrocosm has a direct impact on the microcosm, in this case, Mrs. van der Watt and her young son Fred. In the extract, Mrs. Van der Watt is visited by representatives of the British Army who require her to sign the oath of neutrality to relinquish her loyalties to the South African forces which are in opposition to the British. Due to her courage and rebellion, she refuses, and this means that the family farm is destroyed and its animals slaughtered as punishment in a dystopian depiction of injustice and brutality. So something along those lines would be a fairly good introduction or overview. The next paragraph is all about the setting of the farm itself. So settings are also significant um, a lot of the time in political and social protests writing. The setting of the extract is significant because it represents the transition from a previously tranquil pastoral idyll to a place bearing the wounds of an authoritarian power. Mrs. Van der Watt's home is modest, shown through the list of cheap and valueless items such as my Bible, Fred's christening cup, my needlework case, this diary and pencils. This is not a residence with lavish belongings. It is also worth noting that the possessions the men can confiscate have no monetary worth. They are purely sentimental, such as photographs of parents, pots and pans, and a wedding photograph, which only shows the cruelty and injustice being wielded against the family. The fat mutton was for the previous night's dinner also suggests a modest lifestyle. They had little to begin with, now they have nothing, as the animals are brutally slaughtered and their home burned to the ground. The verbs, hacking and sawing, emphasise the harshness of the family's treatment. The fact salt is put in the family's soil means the land is now useless. What is a farm without land? As a result, nature seems to also show the transition from pastoral farm to barren destruction. So here kind of nature is almost a metaphor for what Mrs. Van der Watt is enduring. There's probably something there to do with eco-critical theory, which is in the critical anthology for the coursework, perhaps. Then we talk about the men, Johnson and Durham. Central to the events of the extract are the representatives of the British Armed Forces, Corporal Johnson and Brigadier Durham. Their titles and rank alone shows them to have superiority over Mrs. Van der Watt, 
as does their predatory body language, where the men get so close facial hair is felt on her cheek. In contrast to mutton and cheap furniture, the men enter with leather and gold items and have crisp paper, adding to their superior status. The way the men look at Mrs. Wonderwatt, such as his eyes wandered down my body, is predatory and threatening, and foreshadows the maliciousness yet to come. The men are also hypocritical, showing the failure and corruption of the ruling elite, and powerful. For example, when Mrs. Wonderwatt refuses to sign the oath, Brigadier Durham accuses her of causing a scene. Smelling the mutton also earns her the title of being uncivilised, which is hugely ironic, seeing as burning down a house and butchering animals is more uncivilised than eating mutton for dinner. Ironically, they also don't like the fact rebels are burning homes, which is exactly what they are doing. Reference to Queen Victoria and her full title is used by the men to, de- to legitimise their extreme actions, as if they are only carrying out what the monarch wishes and to give equal rights to all. Even though the men believe Mrs. Wonderwatt, Mrs. Wonderwatt's actions to be audacious, you would also argue trying to bring a foreign power's laws to a different state is also pretty arrogant. Just like the men are trespassing on the farm, they could also be seen as trespassing in a whole continent. Whereas they are happy to make distinctions between right and wrong on their terms, they fail to see the injustice of their own actions, which is the same as trespassing and criminal damage. So notice, not once do they mention criminal damage or trespassing, but in the eyes of the law, that's exactly what they are doing. So there's a degree of manipulation of the law here. Trespassing is trespassing. It doesn't matter who you are, um, but obviously they don't see that because it, um, it goes against what they're trying to do here. And then the final paragraph, we've spoken about the two men. The final paragraph um, would be about Mrs. Van der Watt. That's another significant character, of course, in this extract. Opposing both men and the British is Mrs. Van der Watt, our homodiegetic narrator who has written the whole event down in her diary in secret, showing her capability to rebel and show courage. Arguably, she should have just signed the oath of neutrality brought to her Yet this would perhaps underestimate the amount of patriotism and principle she has, including loyalty to her homeland. The men's presence makes her feel like a stranger at her own home, suggesting they have made her feel alienated in their place which is hers. Her rebellion is not signing the oath, I refused, shows a character who is willing to accept any consequences or punishments. The way in which the chickens are cornered against the wire could metaphorically represent the way she and Fred feel they have been cornered in their farm, on land that is rightly and legally theirs. The fact her face grew tight at the sight of her home in flames and her animals in pieces of meat suggests an inner resilience and strength that even with everyone killed or destroyed, she keeps someone, she keeps some dignity and hasn't sacrificed her principles. So arguably, therefore, she actually ends up being the winner because they still haven't got what they wanted, um, but she hasn't sacrificed her principles for it. If you wanted to, you could finish off with a little conclusion. That could just be a sentence saying something like, as explained, or as you can see, elements of political and social protest writing are evident in the extract, something like that. And that would be your conclusion. The danger with the conclusion is you would end up repeating yourself unnecessarily. So in summary, then, that is all about paper two, section A, the unseen extract task. This will be unseen to you unless you've read this book because it's an extract that I've created myself. So it's not out there. Um, so you, it is very much like the exam. Um, and yeah, this task is all about connecting the genre of political and social protest and its elements to an extract you've not seen before. And that extract could be prose, poetry or drama. OK, approximately an hour on this, 15 minutes planning, 45 minutes writing, devise an essay plan to begin with like I showed you like that and that will give you a good essay structure Um, and also don't obligate yourself to talk about everything in the extract you can't do that in the time so always pick with a highlighter or you know make a symbol uh, in the margin the significant bits of the extract to you and explain them with as much confidence as you can and have confidence because you know you've been you've been studying literature for two years you know them you know the genre Uh, You can read, you can write, you have everything you need to do well. So good luck um, and thank you very much for watching.